the shock mm. of the news is being felt by all people here all over China. Yeah. That China was contributing a lot more than it used to be to the peacekeeping forces all over the world, and yet this is one of the biggest uh, fatal attack. Yeah. yeah, I think this is a, a fatal attack on the military. Also, China suffered, you know, of the attack in Haiti mm -hmm. you know, years ago. You know, at least uh, five policemen died during the attack. And this time, I think just to show the commitment and the responsibility of China to, you know. Uh, maintain the peace and the stability in Africa, as mentioned uh, last uh, September uh, in the UN Security Council. Mm. Uh, uh, President Xi Jinping also mentioned that China is going to uh, establish um, 8,000 uh, personnel uh, to, uh, to, to, to maintain the peace and the stability in Africa. Okay. Uh, Dr. Mustafa, we understand according to the UN rules, the country in which the peacekeepers are operating should be responsible for the safety and security of these peacekeepers. Of course, we also understand it is very hard for these countries to function that way because the, after all, that is the reason why the peacekeepers are there. And sometimes peacekeepers cannot work with the governments because that means taking sides in the political crisis in those countries. So under such circumstances, looking at the case involving the death of a Chinese peacekeeper. What can be some of the possible ways to take care of these peacekeepers, particularly in Mali, a country like that? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that question. The, the, these groups that have been attacking UN peacekeepers have been attacking soldiers and government forces. They have no regard for authorities. They have no regard for anybody. And anyone who goes there, irrespective of whether they are peacekeepers or going there to enforce laws, keep the peace that is there or not there at all, they consider anyone not on their side to be their enemy. And this is why they are fighting and have been attacking the UN peacekeepers, unfortunately. And I don't see these kind of groups, particularly the Al-Qaeda, Al-Murabitun, the movement for oneness and jihad in West Africa. They are still going to target United Nations peacekeepers and government forces in that area because mm. they have no regard for law whatsoever. Mm. Uh, therefore, let me come back to you, Mr. Mm -hmm. Tang. Mm -hmm. What can China do? Now we understand an investigation team has already been sent out by the Chinese mm -hmm. president to the country of Mali to take a look at the situation and also help the UN and the local government to do the investigation. But what can China do? Is China going to retaliate? Uh, no, I don't think China can do it that way because, you know, uh, the peacekeepers only have, you know, light weapon systems, no artillery, no aircraft carrier or something like that. And this is only for uh, the peacekeeping. This is not, not peacemaking. Uh, there is a big difference between the peacekeeping and the peacemaking. Mm -hmm. And if peacemaking, you can, you know, carry out uh, some, you know, uh, big out operation against the, you know, uh, the groups uh, or extremists. This time, uh, you know, the peacekeepers only you know, following the UN cross and then the also uh, to maintain to the separation of the uh, different groups in that region. So right. I think uh, the peacekeeper is only, you know, a, some. They could uh, only fight soldier. back when they are being yeah. attacked. Yeah. So they have no, no such, uh, you know, retaliatory uh, means. Mr. Gartenstein Ross, Professor, then. Are the peacekeepers now in some of the African countries, such as Mali, the most vulnerable targets for extremists and also for Al-Qaeda-related branches, such as this one? No, I mean, they're clearly not the most vulnerable targets. If you look at jihadist targeting, they've gone after targets that are much, much softer than mm. peacekeepers. They've uh, gone after villages. They've gone after uh, people who are in houses of worship where there's large crowds around. Uh, they've gone after schoolgirls. Uh, they've, um, you know, probably the peacekeepers are a softer target, a more vulnerable target than some of the luxury hotels that jihadists have gone after. Uh, but the bottom line is that they do have defenses. They are able to actually uh, fire back when, when they're attacked. Uh, they're vulnerable, but not the most vulnerable. Mm.
But on the other hand, Professor Gassentai Ross, uh, uh, when you have national, a national from China shot dead, killed by these uh, terrorists, it is very crucial that countries are reacting. Uh, in what way, of course, it should be discussed, but it's very important that countries are reacting. Otherwise, it means further invitation of the extremists or the terrorists for further attacks against the peacekeepers, particularly UN peacekeepers. So what can the international community do? Yeah, yeah that, that's absolutely true. Uh, look, I, I, I think that um, the response to any one attack it, it's a little bit difficult. Um, I mean, to, to look at another thing that, that um, really uh, caused international shockwaves several years ago uh, in, the, uh, in the same region, uh, in Nigeria, you had the Shibak schoolgirls who were taken. Uh, now, ultimately, after that, and it wasn't just because of the schoolgirls being captured by Boko Haram, uh, but you have now the nations of four different, uh, the, the militaries of four different nations going after that organization, and it significantly lost power. Um, now, in the case of peacekeepers being attacked, one thing that I think will be discussed in the future is the rules of engagement. Peacekeepers are increasingly in conflict zones that are different than what uh, the UN mandate anticipates. Uh, mm. Peacekeeping is often thought of as pe keeping peace between two countries or keeping peace in a civil okay. war situation. It doesn't anticipate oh, sorry, as much wait, wait, peacekeepers okay. being targeted okay. by terrorist organizations. And that's something that they'll need to think about from a rules of engagement perspective. Mm. Uh, Dr. Tong, mm -hmm. is that a consideration that we should really put a lot of efforts into, which is the yeah. nature of peacekeeping compared to what it used to be? Yeah. And under such circumstances, what new policies or what new preventive methods actually, should be done? Actually, if we look at peacekeeping activities by UN, uh, which started from 1948, and uh, uh, millions of you know, officers and soldiers participated in uh, such activities. Uh, so I think the, uh, that for the Chinese uh, part, I, I don't think China will do, you know, uh, by itself, by, by for, for the sake of China. It's actually assignment from the UN yes, Security indeed. Council. So I think China will abide by the, you know, all the regulations and uh, all the arrangement by the UN. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, the question is whether uh, the UN's uh, previous mechanism, let's say, just say preventive methods to prevent these peacekeepers from being attacked, and also the locations uh, in which uh, peacekeepers should be and can be sent to, and also the UN peacekeepers' uh, uh, specific ways of protecting themselves and their relations with different parties in crisis, should all these be re-examined, Mr. Garston Ross? I think the answer is yes. Uh, it, it should be re-examined. Look, not that it should necessarily be changed, because when you change the rules of engagement, there's a risk of changing the mission itself. Mm. You want peacekeepers to be peacekeepers, not to be combatant forces or occupying forces. And so the mandate as it's structured makes logical sense that it, it makes the peacekeepers there to keep the peace, not to take a side in a conflict. Mm. The uh, question arises, you know, as Dr. Mustafa pointed out, uh, sometimes they're keeping peace when there's a party that's not going to abide by any rules of international law or rules of armed conflict, and instead is going to view the peacekeepers as an obstacle to their own dominance of a region, and thus attack the peacekeepers. When that happens, does their mandate make sense? Mm. And I think that, that uh, while there's a logic to the current mandate, I think that increasingly in the 21st century, we'll find that it's a mandate that's not best suited to the environments they'll be in. Uh, so I think that, that discussion of change should be undertaken, bearing in mind that any sort of changes that, that we make will also bear their own sets of problems and difficulty. Has the UN and can the UN and international system be able to work that out within a period of time so that the peacekeepers could be safe? Yeah, this is really a dilemma for the peacekeeping activities of the UN. Uh, for example, in the past decade, at least uh, uh, 3,400 you know, peacekeepers killed in, during the activities, mm. during the operations. So 
how can have a safe you know environment for the peacekeepers this is a very tough job for the not only for the peacekeepers but also for the UN uh, at least you know you you have a lot of assignments at least at this moment all over the world mm -hmm. but on the other side how can give a safe environment and give a safe protection including the self-defense uh, capability not only you know a light weapon system this is actually a very uh, challengeable task mm. assignment for the peacekeepers and also for UA. Certainly it is a new question for the United Nations it is also a big question for yeah. China which has been yeah. contributing especially now. the terrorist group you know have already become the main you know challenge for the peacekeeping activities yes, in some countries yes indeed when talk about China's efforts for peacekeeping we have seen China in recent years become a major contributor of troops police and military experts to UN peacekeeping missions according to UN statistics China now has more than 3,000 personnel currently in the field the most of the UN P5 or permanent five nations at least 15 have been killed on different missions. 2015, for example, China promised to contribute 8,000 troops for the UN peacekeeping standby forces. And China is set to contribute more than 10% of the UN peacekeeping budget from the year 2016 to 2018, making it the second largest financial contributor mm -hmm. after the United States to the UN peacekeeping. As China becomes more deeply involved with UN operations, of course, many questions that China are concerned mm -hmm. about when it comes to its UN peacekeeping personnel. So Mr. Garstein Ross, even though the United States is contributing the biggest amount of uh, financial support to UN peacekeeping, uh, the number of peacekeepers from US are fewer than China. And yet the question is, how can the permanent five together with the Security Council now, uh, with increasing number of the attacks against peacekeepers, be able to figure out a solution. I understand what you talk about, Mr. Gashtan Ross, that it's important not to change the mandate, at least we are very sure about it, but it is also very important that we are coming up with some timely plan. Right, look, I, I actually didn't say that we shouldn't change the mandate. Uh, I do think the mandate should change. Mm. All I was saying is that just as there's cost to having the mandate as it is now, there's cost to changing it. Ultimately, I think those costs are worth it. But the thing that we need to think through is how do you change the mandate while not changing the role of UN peacekeepers uh, into an occupying force rather than a peacekeeping force? Hmm. That's a difficulty, but I don't think the mandate as it's currently put together is appropriate for the situation in which peacekeepers find themselves. Right. The reason why peacekeepers are, are used so much, the reason why China is, is um, so uh, active in supporting peacekeeping missions is because China has commercial interests all over the world. It understands that stability is beneficial to China just as it's beneficial to countries of the region, just as it's beneficial to the United mm. States. And so both countries are believers in a peacekeeping mission. Mm. Uh, now, we increasingly have, have states that are challenged by internal difficulties, multiple kinds of instability, multiple kinds of armed factions. And um, it's a problem that we're going to be dealing with for decades to come. So supporting um, ways to make governance better is important for both countries, but we're going to have to think through how to make peacekeeping work right. for the challenges that we face in the 21st century. Can African countries themselves also be more responsible for the security and safety of peacekeepers from all over the world there to help African countries? Yeah, you know, overall the way this war on terror has been fought and uh, 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 prosecuted around the world, it seems to most of us that it's been counterproductive. And we're focusing on uh, uh, only areas where we are only attacking and, 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 you know, all the time being offensive. We are not focusing what all needs to be done at the community level. What do we do with the communities that are neglected? And in this case in Mali, you know, the, the regime of uh, uh, Muammar Gaddafi was taken out uh, um, uh, at the behest of Security Council Resolution 1973. People didn't care what was going to happen 
to the militias that uh, Muammar Gaddafi was controlling. And these guys just went down south, the Sahel, with the weapons that they had and ammunition that they had, and they created chaos mm. in parts of Sahel, Mali, and other places there. And this is something that uh, governments, the United Nations, have got to look at and address, while at the same time, look at the communities that are neglected, which then welcomes these groups.